Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation.
thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. The session will begin promptly at the top of the hour. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a great conversation. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, so pleased that you could be here for another episode of Ideas with Michael Bach. I am conveniently named Michael Bach, so I must be your host. Really need to come up with a better line there. And my pronouns are he, him. So, so very happy that you could be with us today for this episode. Uh, this is a series that I launched at the beginning of this year to engage in a discussion about some of the most pressing issues we're facing in inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, or IDEA. See what I did there? I created this series to really elevate the conversation and to engage with IDEA practitioners and champions who can share their experiences, both good and bad, and help people learn from them and I'm so thrilled that so many of you have decided to join us here today. Um, events like this, eh, they're a lot of work, not gonna lie, um, but I wanna say a special thank you to my team, uh, particularly my event producer, Mike, who is on today's session, who also has the dubious responsibility of being my husband. Um, so no, he does not have a choice. But I would also like to make a special thank you to our series sponsor, Denton's, Denton's is the world's largest law firm by lawyers and has really taken their work and idea very seriously. I have worked with this firm for over 20 years, nearly 20 years, somewhere around 20 years. Um, and I am so honored uh, to have them as a sponsor of this series. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. If you are joining us via the Zoom webinar platform, you will not be able to unmute yourself nor turn on your camera. Additionally, you will only be able to send messages in the chat to the hosts and panelists. 
Now, we do this to ensure that people who may disagree with what we're talking about aren't able to disrupt the session. If you have any technical issues or questions, please use the chat function and our producer, Mike, will be happy to assist you. And please do not ask him about what I'm like as Osmond. If you're joining us on the live stream, you are able to make comments, but, and it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, please keep them respectful. We can disagree without resorting to calling people names. My guests and I are going to have a chat, but you are able to engage and ask questions. If you're using the Zoom platform, please ask your questions using the Q&A function. You can ask them at any time and we'll work them into the conversation at an appropriate time. Now, if you're joining us on the live stream, you can also ask questions by posting them on the platform you're on and we will do our best to respond to them as they come up. The show is being recorded and will be available in about a week as a podcast. If you wanna know more about the podcast or download an episode, please visit my website at michaelbach.com slash ideas and look for uh, ideas with Michael po Michael Bach on your favorite podcast platform. Okay, that about covers the housekeeping. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation. On today's episode, we'll be exploring the theme of data and measurement. How do you measure the impact of your idea efforts? What data should you be collecting to better understand if and when you've achieved your objectives? And how do you measure in a way that avoids being perceived as performative or just ticking the box? Now today I'm joined by not one, but two amazing guests who are gonna share their experience and insights on this very topic. Laura McGee is the founder and CEO of Diversia, a technology company that uses artificial intelligence to help companies and investors unlock diversity for improved performance. Diversio is a two-time recipient of Fast Company's World Changing Idea, Ideas Award and has been featured at global events like the G20 and Davos. Through partnerships including UN Women, the Investor Leadership Network, and the Human Resources Professionals Association, Laura leads industry-level change in DEI practices. Prior to Diversio, Laura was a consultant at McKinsey & Company in their public and social sector practice. She was named co-chair of Canada's expert panel on women entrepreneurs and holds board and advisor positions with Global Citizen, Arcturn Ventures, and the University of Waterloo. She's a C100 Fellow and David Rockefeller Fellow with the Trilateral Commission. Laura's a lawyer by training and a graduate of the University of Toronto and Western University, and she lives currently in New York City. Dana Kim is the founder and CEO of Highlight, a Series A product intelligence platform. For years, Dana spent endless hours in malls and grocery stores and focus group facilities as a field researcher tasked with collecting critical physical product feedback for target consumers on behalf of customers like Starbucks, Nike, and Coca-Cola. She got her MBA at the Wharton School so she could build Highlight, the first and only end-to-end -end agile product testing platform, enabling the efficient collection of scaled product performance data. While Highlight launched in 2021, one, it's seen runway growth and scale, having tested thousands of products at a fraction of the time and cost of traditional analog methods and becoming the dominant SaaS platform in the product testing space. Dana and Laura, welcome to the show. Hey, Michael. Hey, Michael. Laura and I know each other fairly well. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure um, that so, you're a great husband. <laughs> you know, we have uh, two, uh, I think, fantastic people to talk about this very conversation. So Laura, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about Diversio. Yeah, so uh, I think data, definitely the name of the game. So um, Diversio effectively is a software platform specifically devoted to measuring and tracking diversity and inclusion, ultimately culture within organizations. Um, and the problem, the pain point that we set out to solve is that Companies understand the benefits of having a broader talent pool and making sure that people feel engaged and productive, but um, taking stock of where that's happening, where it's not and why is challenging. And so our goal is to add some rigor and some data to that process through metrics and artificial intelligence. And that's effectively what we bring to bear using the software product. That's great. And, and I can say with uh, some certainty that it's a great product, uh, having worked 
with the Diversio platform. Um, I think it is uh, it is uh, a great addition to what we do in the idea space. So Dana, same question for you. Tell us a little bit more about, about Highlight. Yeah, um, I, I always like to start with the astounding stat that 30,000 products are launched every year and 90% of them fail. Um, folks quote this stat a lot in our industry and in consumer products. Um, and if anything, um, over the past decade, it's only gotten worse and it's only gotten harder to be successful. Um, so the pain point that Highlight set out to solve is how can consumer product companies of all sizes across all verticals uh, collect the data they need to really understand their consumers deeply, to really collect scaled product performance data so that they can launch and, and renovate effectively. So we have brands like Nestle and P&G and Estee Lauder. We also have um, emerging and disruptive brands like Momofuku and Bombas and um, you name it. Um, testing on highlights for competitive benchmarking and pre-launch formulation testing and in-market product renovation and concept testing and, and more really to ensure products, uh, the products they're launching are successful. Um, so data is at the heart of everything we do. We are a data platform. Um, and so we really internalize that, which I'm ex excited to share more with you as, as the conversation progresses. Uh, I, um, I'm uh, gooped is the word I'm going to use by that statistic, 30,000 products launch every year and 90% of them fail. That is, um, it's a big number. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Dan, I want to stay with you and mm -hmm. we're over the course of, of the next hour, we're going to talk about Highlight from two perspectives as an employer, but also as a service provider and how data plays into that from a diversity perspective. So Let's start with as an employer, how important is it for you to have your employees demographic data and, and really how does it impact uh, the way you operate your business? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the the short answer to how important is our employees demographic data is it's it's very important. But the long answer is it's it's just the beginning. Uh, I think um, both from a consumer research perspective and an internal how do we really understand our employee base and our, our team's makeup? Um, we start with demographics, of course, but those can um, be uh, just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding um, the humans on our team. Um, and so we, as a sort of people organization, as a leadership team, as a, as a whole team, um, really try and dig deeper into what is that um, more um, robust, broad definition of representation and how can we um, beyond the sort of standard check the box demographics, um, ensure we are building diversity internally. Um, we care about, sure, all the typical demos, but we care about uh, background. We care about lived experiences. We care about identity. We, um, uh, again, demographics are, are just the start. Um, we also make sure that as we grow and scale the organization, we're not thinking about highlight as a whole. Um, we're thinking about our team and we're breaking it down into um, uh, our leadership team, our executive leadership team, our senior leadership team, our management team, uh, we're breaking it across, bringing it down across departments and engineering and product and design and customer success. Those makeups look very different traditionally and at highlight. Um, and so all of that goes to say we have sort of a few different ways of, of operationalizing that. Um, firstly, we, we do have a sort of North Star set of key results for our organization. We follow the sort of um, well, well known, well regarded OKR framework, objectives and key results as a company to ensure we're marching towards success in any given quarter, half, or year. And one of our global, um, you know, of th one of three objectives is our value that is um, humans first. And one of the key results that that tells us if we're doing a good job at being uh, uh, humans first is an inclusion score, and another. Um, is an engagement score. And so um, ensuring that we are looking at, at the same time we're looking at gross margin and bookings, that we are looking at inclusion score and engagement score, um, we're really orienting the team around this focus. Um, we do do biannual um, diversity inclusion surveys. Um, we do you know, tons of L&D programming, all that good stuff. We've, we've used Diversio as a wonderful partner in that. Um, we have ERGs, et cetera, but uh, I think most importantly, um, having a perspective, writing a DEI mission statement, um, and um, having the key result across the organization and really um, elevating that um, has been key. Yeah, and, and you mentioned a couple of things there that I think are 
a really, really critical point. It's one thing to have the diversity. It's another thing for that diversity to feel included, valued, and like they they matter. I'm, I, I have hesitations over the word belonging, but that's a whole other uh, thing. <laughs> um, it it is it is important to understand the demographic makeup of your employees to understand for lack of a better description, who's missing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you also have to dig into that um, that sort of position of how do they feel in the organization? Are they contributing to their fullest potential? You know, really important uh, aspect of that. So Laura, I want to come to you now. From your experience working with clients, what are the top reasons that our employers are collecting uh, not just demographic data, but also inclusion data for their employees? So I would start by saying not everyone is as enlightened as Dana. Um, right. And so I think a lot of <laughs> a lot of companies are collecting demographic data because, you know, they've always done it or the government told them to or an investor asked for it. Um, I think ultimately the people who we see the best ROI come from their efforts, it's a strategy and it's about optimizing talent. And so the analogy that I'm going to use, and it just made up, so it may not make any sense, is if you want to produce the world's best car, so maybe you want to make the next Ferrari or, I don't know, Porsche, whatever it is, you want to source parts. You're not going to limit yourself to one country. You're not going to say, I'm only going to source parts from Germany, and then that's going to create the best car in the world. You want to, you want to broaden, and you want, obviously, a wide variety of parts. You can't build a car with just engines. You need doors, handles, et cetera. But then also, when you're producing that car, you want to remove any bottlenecks or any impediments to each of those um, you know, resources being contributed to the car. So it's not just about getting the right people into the room or the right you know, resources into the car. It's also about making sure that each resource is best positioned to do its best work and really smoothing that process. So I think the clients that we have that get that and really uh, see it as a business strategy and means to an end, which is typically both revenue and expenses, that's the beauty of DEI is you get both, they're the ones who, you know, end up getting that buy-in, keeping it, and and really enduring with, with the uh, with their approach. I, I yeah, I think um, first of all, great analogy. I think it works. Um, <laughs> Perfect. I, you're reminding me of a bit of a famous story from, and I'm hesitating to say it, and you'll know why in a second. From Boeing, um, mm -hmm. when they were building. Mm, an airplane, I forget which one, um, they uh, were very conscious about the diversity of the team in every aspect. Um, and before anyone says doors, it wasn't the doors. They were building a design for a new wing on their airplane. If you look at the, the wings, you'll see the swoop up on the sides. I can't do it because my, my camera's too tight. But um <laughs> Anyway, they they paid attention to the diversity of that team, not just from demographic perspective, but also from skills and experience perspective, different legacy companies. They were very, very careful. And what they ended up with is one of the most fuel efficient wings that has ever mm -hmm. been designed for an airplane. And it is through having that um, uh, data and that demographic information and as well as the inclusion data that they managed to um, come up with that. So, you know, great analogy, and I think it's an important one. So Dana, thinking about Highlight as an employer, um, what are one of, or two of, of your biggest success stories as they relate to data and measurement around inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility? Yeah, um, I don't have a manufacturing analogy. <laughs> As we as we build this Ferrari, um, uh, there are um, I think back to the first time we ever um, launched a DEI survey, which was about a year ago. Um, we're we're about three years old, almost three and a half now, um, old as a company, um, and we didn't start formally codifying this until two years in. Um, we were a surprised, and um, you know. Uh, happily surprised, wonderfully surprised that um, uh, we had really high participation rates. 99% of our team um, filled out um, our DEI survey, um, and that that felt um, 
uh, really compelling to us because the team trusted us with their data. They were bought into um, the initiative around measuring DEI internally. Um, and um, so that was so, sort of signal number one that the team is bought into the mission. Um, and then when we actually received um, the data back, um, both in the quantitative data and in the qualitative data, um, we were pleasantly surprised by um, the breadth of our demographic makeup and the diversity of the team um, and how much they were willing to share around um, that how they are feeling and the diversity they're looking for and the representation they're looking for and the connectivity they're looking for beyond the sort of traditional check the box demographics. Um, I mentioned we we, um, we launched ERGs recently um, and we've slowly been building up what are the different communities that really will have an impact on our team. Um, and uh, one that came out of you know our DEI survey open-end responses and open text boxes was um, our Brain Brights ERG, um, which is uh, focused entirely on mental health, neurodivergent, and invisible, invisible disabilities. Um, and that's not something that, you know, the leadership team or the people to, people team like sat in a room brainstorming what would, what would matter, what would help, or what would, you know, truly um, have an impact here. It was from the ground up, um, our, our team trusting us with Hey, it would be really nice to connect in these spaces. Um, and and we, um, again, we've since have um, built three ERGs and, and are launching a fourth one because we um, want to create these like support systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that that was probably our our, our biggest um, success story was just the, when we set out to measure um, idea data, um, we um, we got company buy-in, we were able to su successfully measure it at scale, and we were able to go beyond the traditional um, quantitative survey responses and really pull some organic asks and feedback out of the, the qualitative responses. Um, I, I'm gonna go a bit off script because I wanna ask you about the 99% the response rate, which is mm -hmm. uh, exceptional. Um, was there anything specifically that you did to get to that number? Or was it just that you had a culture that was trusting? Yeah, um, you know, it's there. I wouldn't say that there's anything specific that we did. We didn't incentivize. We didn't set a hard deadline. We didn't offer gift cards. Um, but I would say our people team is fantastic. We have a three-person lean and mean people team um, that is constantly um, espousing the importance of idea um, across our organization. And I think generally our team is really bought in top down, bottoms up, through and through middle managers. We have a, a very um, uh, organic, I think, intentional approach to ensuring that it's a focus always. So when the survey comes around, it's not like, why are we filling this out? It's, mm -hmm. this makes sense. This is an opportunity to share my voice. Um, Hannah in particular on our team does a fantastic job of um, reminding people why and making it not a, a another task on my to do, but this is a an opportunity to be heard and this is for you. Um, so yeah, I think um, no no specific tactics other than ongoing elevating the importance and making our team feel really heard. Right. So really, uh, culture and mm -hmm. making sure that that is ingrained in everything you do as an organization. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is really critical to building that success. So coming back to um, some of the, you, you talked about the success stories with the ERGs, which I, I think is an awesome outcome. Um, have there been any downsides, any oops moments that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, I think when we look at our, our um, the results of that, that survey, um, we lean on, um, anecdotal experience of our three person people team of our, of our leadership team of our, our managers to assess, um, is, is this good? Is this good enough? Um, and we haven't been able to really easily, um, benchmark against others mm -hmm. at our stage and in our industry. Um, we have data now internally that we're tracking over time, but data availability in a more macro sense, we haven't, um, quite cracked. Um, we haven't found, um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't, uh, sort of hit our stride there. So I think there is an opportunity for us both sort of qualitatively to, to dig into, um, 
or to, to make connections with other people, leaders at our stage, other leaders at our stage, spend time, we spend, we spend so much time in the business. Um, I think we could do a better job of extrapolating um, how that falls um, on a sort of broader scale. Um, I'm sure Laura has a lot of ideas there, but. Um, I was going to say, Dana, we've got data. Let's, <laughs> well, we, presented it. we should send you some benchmarks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we, yeah, we're always looking for, I mean, across the board, we're, we're always looking for um, uh, our internal data and how that falls across stage and industry and, you know, across all things people. Um, but yeah, that's been one place where we're like, we feel like we're doing great. We're, we're feeling good. Our team's giving us good feedback, but um, is there, is there more? Michael, can I, can I pick up on that? Yeah, please. You're coming to you next. So please go ahead. I think that's, it's such a common, I mean, and Dana, like you're running a tech company, the number of metrics the first round wants us to track that I've never heard of before is like all of them. <laughs> and it's like 200. Um, so I think, look, getting situated and saying, here's like the indicator that we're going to, you know, rely on um, as a signal of strength, whatever it is. And then saying like, what out of 10, what number should we be at? Like, that's really hard to get acclimated. And what's interesting yeah. about this space is like, what's okay or good is actually different across metrics. So we, when we talk to our clients, we typically look at things like, you know, mentorship, culture, harassment, bias. And like the number for harassment, it's like, it's gotta be 10 out of 10. Like really anything other, like under 10 out of 10, like you as a leader, that's a huge risk for your business. So you can't, that's the easy one. But for things like, you know, mentorship and sponsorship, like most companies are sitting around a seven out of 10. And for underrepresented people, it's, you know, a five or a six. And so it's like, if you're doing an eight and a seven, that's actually, okay, you know, you're above average, lot obviously room to improve. But, um, and what's interesting is your focus area doesn't necessarily correspond with how high you're ranking. And so you want to go both, how do I compare to industry and where can I differentiate and where there may be systemic barriers that, you know, are just part of our work. Um, and then where do we want to be strategically? Like, what do we want to be known for? What does our culture look like? We can't be perfect at everything. So where do we start? Uh, the benchmarking data really helps, but I think you combine it. I know you do this well. You combine it with what, what you stand for as a company. And that, that I think is where the strategy comes from. I, I think, Dana, the, um, sorry, that Laura, that you, you just hit on something that is so incredibly important. And that is that there isn't just this one size fits all um approach to data and measurement like we um clients all the time are like oh i need you know i need to compare myself okay but you need to compare yourself to relevant data you need to you know i can tell you what uh this law firm is doing say dentons um but if you're not a law firm that's completely irrelevant to what you do as an organization and it is, I, I think, so very important to make sure that um, it's it's relevant data and it works for your organization and it's specific to what you do. And it's complex. It is not a simple, like, oh, if I get the demographics, everything is solved. That is a very, very narrow way of looking at uh, data and measurement. So I wanna stay with you, Laura, Let's talk about some success stories of your clients that you can share in the idea space based on having collected uh, demographic information. Yeah, so I'm gonna go a little bit rogue here. It's a bit unexpected. Um, there's one CEO in particular that we work with in the South. Um, and what really impressed me about the CEO is when he, it was a, a man, when he got um, the data back, a lot of it was honestly quite negative. And it was the first time they'd done this. Response rates were actually quite high, which is a good indicator. At least people feel honest. I mean, the worst thing is when you have really high scores and really low response rates, like that you're not t being told anything. Um, but what really impressed me about the CEO is he was able to really take a step back, not panic, and say, okay, where, like, where do I begin? So where is the most critical pain point? What is the step that I can take tomorrow? Kind of 30, 60, 90 to solve that initial pain point? What message do I need to put out to staff immediately to let them know that I'm working on it? And then again, let's take a step back and realize this is a multi-year journey. So really think forward. This is no longer you know, a six month goal like they had anticipated. This is a three-year goal. And so let's be short and long-term focused. 
Um, and again, really communicate, really convey that message to staff that like, look, it's a work in progress. I'm going to start with the most important things. I am going to apply my judgment, by the way. I am the CEO. I have to make the hard decisions. Um, but this will be an ongoing iterative process. And, and I really, I, I thought that was exactly right. It, it showed a lot of, I think, wisdom. And where, in contrast, companies can go wrong is people get freaked out in this area. In particular, like it's very sensitive. It's something that your kids are going to bring up at the dinner part at the dinner table. You're going to talk about it at parties, um, and it's interesting to me how many very level-headed, very uh, you know, um, competent leaders will look at an inclusion scorecard and just again panic. Um, so I, yeah, I would say that panic is a good word, um, <laughs> and, and it, it it is. Um, you know, I find it, having worked with clients around this for, you know, a decade, um, it, I'm always surprised at how people respond because of course I make assumptions about how people are going to respond and, and they either do or do not meet my expectations. Um, but it, it, you know, I always caution people to say, you know, you're going to see a lot of data. Now let's take a deep breath and figure out what this means for your organization. So Laura, staying with you though, any any downsides, any stories you can share of uh, the bad of what you've seen with clients? Oh, Without I do have a recent names, of course. Yeah, I won't I won't in the name, but there was a recent one. Um, and it was it was so bad that the chair of their board called us to kind of come in and intervene. But there was um, a fairly new diversity and inclusion manager who, you know, the survey showed some negative results. In no world was that his fault. He was, you know, new. They said, yeah, history of culture. Um, but I think this person very understandably, as a, again, as a human being, worried about his job and worried about his performance and then kind of took out the chainsaw and started firing people and cutting costs and, you know, eliminating programs and standing up new things. And, um so again, I think like he didn't, the problem organizationally, he didn't have the buy-in, the support, the oversight of a senior executive. And so this was allowed to happen. Um, but ultimately, hopefully, I think we've helped him course correct. Well, that's good to hear. Um, there, I, you know, I, I think of one story of a client many years ago who just blindly ignored the data. Um, mm -hmm. Similar, you know, we... Uh, did a survey and the results were really poor and the client argued them and refused to believe them and then put out a, a message saying, everything's great. You're all happy and saw voluntary turnover go through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely not the approach that I would recommend. Believe the data is very important. So Dana, let's talk about it from a client perspective. How do you use idea data as part of your work um, with your clients? Yeah, um, so we have, the way our product works, we have a uh, customer facing app experience. Um, and that is where the researcher at Momofuku can test their newest chili sauce um, and um, they are targeting an audience, shipping them product and collecting feedback. Uh, we also have a tester side experience. That's what we call our highlighter community. Um, and in the highlighter uh, and in the highlighter app, um, the highlighter is signing up, entering in some basic profile um, questions. Um, that is essentially a combination of demographics and psychographics and behavioral um, answers, uh, questions that we ask for answers to. Um, Fundamentally, um, in building out our product, we have to A, decide what those questions are in the highlighter profile. Um, and then B, we have to um, ensure that as an offering, we have the most diverse set of highlighters and representative set of highlighters um, so that we can um, support as many customers as possible. It is business critical for Highlight to be able to um, say to any customer, whether you are Haynes testing underwear, whether you are go macro testing protein bars, whether you are camelback testing water bottles, whether you are, you know, testing dog food, whatever it might be, um, that we in the highlighter community have a, a, a set of consumers for you that fits the, the demographic, psychographics, behavioral stuff, um, the, the profile that you are looking for to test your products. Um, 
So there's a lot of decisions that go into how we ask the questions, how we recruit the community, how we engage the community um, that have really enforced um, uh, a, a an intentional approach to ide idea data as it relates to highlight. Um, you can imagine that when we are, we're constantly um, trying to juggle different perspectives um, and make as many highlighters or community members happy as possible and make as many customers um, as, as happy as possible. And sometimes there's a tension there. Um, there, for example, um, uh, a very traditional way to target an audience in research is gender. Um, but how do you ask about gender um, is a very complicated question. Um, and so we decided early on um, after much research um, that we would try and sort of um, balance perspectives and, and put our stake in the ground around, we don't ask gender, we ask preferred pronouns. Um, and uh, that is a required question to be a part of the highlighter community because um, customers will not accept data that doesn't include that identifier. Right. Um, that is not a, an acceptable um, gender uh, screener question for all. Um, there are companies that will not, you know, will not be named that force us to ask a gender question on top of that um, because they, they do not accept that answer um, and it deviates from their traditional screener. Um, so there's a lot of tension and intentionality, opportunity for us to infuse perspective and to push back around what is best practice um, that we are thinking about all the time. Um, and revisiting all the time. Um, it's not at all um, a make a decision and move on. It's it's highly, highly iterative. Um, yeah. And we do see um, our customers' perspectives around how they talk about who they are looking for change. Um, and we do see trends across cohorts. Um, so that's, that's the first um, bucket of, of sort of how idea data um, is is a core part of our, our work and our software. Um, the second is just um, a core use case for Highlight, which is you know supporting customers in innovating or renovating product portfolios is um, customers are oftentimes using Highlight to launch new products, renovate old products um, in order to ensure a new product is meeting new customers' needs that might be underserved. Um, they might be identifying um, an unmet, uh, an entirely new cohort of customers and figuring out what are the jobs to be done for that customer. Um, they are looking to really um, understand new sets of customers and how their products might fit into those customers' lives um, via Highlight. So um, we are, you know, our mission, um, our um, job as highlight is to ensure accurate targeting from real consumers who are able to give accurate, honest feedback to ensure that collectively we are supporting, you know, the building of better products for all. Can I ask, can I ask a follow-up question? <laughs> um, I'm wondering, Dana, so, okay, quick yeah. anecdote and Michael, stop me if I'm going off script. Um, mm -hmm. Quick anecdote, I remember really early into starting Diversio, I had lunch with the new CEO of Sky Media, who's this Scottish guy, a little bit older, really actually great guy. Mm -hmm. And he said at the beginning of the lunch, and this was not a DEI lunch, I was just one of, I think, 10 AI companies that he was meeting with. He said, my number one priority is to diversify my staff this year. My number one strategic priority, I'm a new CEO, is in particular women. They had very few women at the company, in particular in product and engineering. And Sky Media and Gaming is like a, you know, a betting, a betting a, a gaming company. Mm -hmm. And I asked him why, like, that's, you know, a big, uh, a big goal given it's your first year. And he said, I looked at our customer data and I noticed that I think something like 20% of their clients, of their users were men, were uh, women. And then he mm -hmm. looked at their engineering team and noticed that 20% of their engineering team were women. Mm -hmm. And in his mind, huge opportunity. If he wants to like quickly expand market, he can and grab market, like it, he needs to diversify. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was such an interesting and kind of really obvious. And so my question for you is when companies approach you and say, hey, these are the demographics that, you know, we typically go after, we typically sell to, um, do you ever get to take the opportunity to say, hey, by the way, we have these other diverse product testers and users. And if you wanted to expand, you know, uh, your coverage, we'd happily, you know, help you out there. Does that ever kind of come up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, so we, we support a one man emerging brand and we support a, you know, 
billion dollar enterprises. Um, and depending on where they are, they all have different, um, where they fall on that spectrum, they have different sense of, of understanding who is my customer. Um, oftentimes the emerging, the smaller the brand, and the brand could be either an emerging brand or it could be a one person, um, a one person team within a you know massive corporation, uh, but they're gonna sort of behave the same in that um, they think they know their earliest adopters, but they are looking to expand because they know they need to, as a brand, expand the TAM. So they have a natural openness to um, new frontiers of consumers, um, understanding audiences at large, not feeling militant around this is my loyal customer base and that's who I need to serve. The more mature a brand is and the more the bigger a brand team is, um, the more they research they have done over time um, around who is their customer, what is the segmentation, and they're far more laser focused on um, that specific cohort um, as the their, their um, sort of key um, stakeholders, key people they are building for. Um, so we definitely, we are constantly starting with, um, you know, we, we have um, folks on our team who are um, trained in um, research scoping and research strategy and customer strategy. Um, and we're constantly pushing the bounds on who do you really want to talk to and can we broaden your aperture? Um, but the resistance varies based on maturity of the organization. And um, it's sort of an inverse relationship between um, uh, maturity of organization and um, openness to um, exploring new customer types. That being said, there are, you know, Nestle Accelerator, P&G Ventures, there are these little sort of SWAT teams within the greater corporates that are more open-minded, but um, it's it's absolutely a sort of, um, we, we see a, a very clear spectrum um, and it's absolutely a, a, an area within our product that we've thought, okay, can we get in the workflow now that a consumer, a customer is in software and moving through the project steps, can we raise a literal red flag saying, hey, have you thought about this audience? Um, those are absolutely conversations we're having. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it, it raises something, um, Dana, as you were talking, I was thinking about a very famous story from uh, Frito-Lay um, many years ago that mm -hmm. wanted to get into the uh, Latin Hispanic market in the US, which is worth billions and billions and trillions of dollars. And mm -hmm. so they brought a, you know, guacamole flavored tortilla chip to the market and it was a disaster. Yeah. And it was a disaster because they hadn't tested it with the intended purchaser. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you treat a product like it is going to be applicable for every market, like it's just this universal thing, it may be a hit or it may miss completely with one market if you haven't necessarily tested it with that market. I think mm -hmm. it's, you know, th this is, in yeah. my opinion, it's pretty yeah. simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But for others, maybe not so much. Yeah, yeah. Another another famous case study is just Nike as, as a, an organization started off building products for men. All their fit testers and wear testers were for men um, and their female products, their, their products for women or uh, folks who identify as women, we're all um, following the sort of shrink it and pink it formula. Um, and and um, the it's it's a well-known case study. I mean, Nike has done um, gone a long ways to course correct, um, but it was one of those, you talk about oops moments um, that came to light and, um, you know, uh, it, it has real, real impact, long-standing impact. Yeah. The, 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 the whole shrink it and pink it routine. Oh, that just gives me a <laughs> headache when I think about it too much, but it's, you know, I don't know if you know this, there are some differences between uh, people who identify as men and people who identify as women. I, th that's probably uh, news to everyone who's watching. Um, Laura, <laughs> where <laughs> the, let, let's talk basics. Where do companies go wrong when it comes to, uh, idea data collection, whether that's amongst employees or amongst clients. Yeah, I, I think I saw a question in the chat um, and Dana started, I think, probably intuitively got there. Um, number one, if you don't have the trust of your employees, like garbage in, garbage out. So if people are not, um, you know, if they don't feel comfortable, if they don't feel like it's anonymous or at least being used for a positive purpose, if that's not communicated at the beginning from the leader, like from the C, I'm talking like very top level, you're gonna lose them. 
And you'll probably get a lot of false positives, which is the worst thing that you can, this is the worst kind of false positive you can get because if something like harassment exists, it will affect productivity. It will create a risk for you. It will blow up at some point in some fashion and it will spread. It's quite toxic. Um, and there's nothing worse than, worse than a sense of false comfort. It's like having cancer and not having a diagnosis. So I think not creating space and, and building that trust to get accurate quality data is number one. And then I would say like building on top, this is trite, but you have to do something with the data. To keep that trust, you have to then go and message your employees transparently, here, here are the findings. And so certainly we've seen cases where, you know, the data is cleaned every way through Monday and it's like, give me 20 industry benchmarks so I can pick the one that makes us look the best. Like um, going back and, you know, to your point earlier, employees know, like people know what the experience is. They all talk, they're all in WhatsApp groups and sorry to break it to you. And so if you go back and tell them we're 10 out of 10, we're above average in every respect, like they call bullshit. Um, so communicating like here's like the pros of what we found and the cons. Like I think typically you'll find that you get a lot of, you know, uh, understanding, not always, but typically. Um, and so I think it's number one, get good quality data, invest in building the trust and then invest in communicating the outcome. And, and you don't have to do a million things. I think that's another thing where I've seen companies go wrong is they feel like they've got to do 20 programs None of them work. Everyone's exhausted. They've now got a million ERGs, not four like Dana. Um, and then their money is wasted. So I think being strategic and selective on interventions, communicating them clearly, that's the second component. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, trust is something that is so critical to um, this sort of data collection, employee or client. And trust takes time to build. Uh, you know, in Dana's case, obviously, that's been something that's been instilled since day one of the organization at Highlight. But, you know, at some organizations that things have been allowed to fester for years, that trust is going to take a long time to build. And, you know, don't boil the ocean is a great piece of advice. Pick a couple things, do it well, make sure you're delivering, you know, what you promised and then move on to something else, but make sure you are improving the environment. Let, let's talk about investors because I, I, you know, this is a unique aspect of having both of you on. Both of your organizations have experience with investors. How important is data and measurement in, in idea from an investment perspective? Maybe, uh, why don't I give the macro and then Dana, you give the micro. So I'll give yeah. like what we see across our client base. And then I know you have a particular uh, experience here. So at the macro level, um, there's a bifurcation, um, but the side that cares is growing. And there's definitely regional differences. We find diversity and inclusion data for European investors and British investors is essential. And so it's part of every, you know, diligence request form. If a big institutional investor is going to give money to a private equity fund, they need to know what they've got in place, what their numbers look like, et cetera. In Canada, same thing. All of our pensions are very, very committed and dedicated. And just for context, we do a lot of work with investors. Our investor client base collectively controls, I think it's 10.1 trillion, trillion with a T in AUM. So these are very influential names like, you know, State Street, Generali, Canada Pension Plan, et cetera. Um, and all of them have come to us because they're like, we need metrics. And they don't typically want metrics unless they care to track them. So I think, you know, it's growing in importance. It is true that in some areas of the world, I won't name states, um, there is a backlash and there are uh, funds and investors that are, you know, adamantly opposed to this because they think that it's uh, the antithesis of equality of opportunity. Okay, fine, you're not gonna win them all. Um, but as a, as a general trend, if we follow the regulators, if we follow the biggest pools of capital, I'm thinking like the Black Rocks of the world, this is the direction that they're trending in. They will set the standard and we are seeing that that start to filter down. Absolutely. And, and those objectors, you know, they'll, uh, they'll catch up eventually. It'll go beyond. I mean, not. This... And it's a business advantage that they're not going to realize. And that's honestly, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a problem. Yeah, that, that's a, absolutely. Dana, from from your experience, obviously, directly with, uh, with Highlight. Yeah, um, I think I have a, a, a potentially unique experience with investors. And maybe this is, you know, speaks to the, the company that you keep. Um, uh, but we have, um, so we're a series A company. Our last two rounds were a series A and a seed. 
Um, the lead investors across those uh, rounds were First Round and then Acre and Hearst, um, all of which have um, very progressive views towards DEI. Um, all who, all of whom, um, value and measure DEI, um, uh, but are, um, I would say, founder first and company first in terms of ensuring that. It doesn't just become an accounting burden or a measurement burden or an unnecessarily tick the box tracking thing. Um, we just to give you a, a real sense of what that looks like, um, focusing on our Series A, um, Acre and Hearst co-led. Um, Hearst Lab um, is the entity that that um, co-led the round. Um, Eve Burton is the only woman in the C-suite at Hearst. She's the ex executive sponsor. They invest only in female founders, and it's really important for them to know um, that. I am in the game. I have skin in the game. We have a really strong leadership team that is diverse. We actually have a seven person executive team and six are women. Um, and so um, those are those are stats um, that um, they don't ask for, um, but that they really value and is what um, helps them drum up executive support and ultimately investment across the organization. Um, Acre um, is um, actually an impact fund. Um, they are focused on climate and impact. Um, and as actually a, a term in our term sheet for Series A investment, they had a diversity rider that we need to have a DEI policy in place um, in order for us to operate go forward. Um, you know, them diligencing us and getting to know us and our team, um, they weren't worried about it, <laughs> and they saw sort of how organically it's come up. But um, they are um, uh, investing with an eye towards companies that share the same values and ensuring that. Um, it's not a very specific tactical, this is what you must do, X, Y, Z cost, X, Y, Z return. It's um, you value this, you are comfortable, um, you know, with a, an investor who values this and will hold you accountable if we don't feel like we're trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see that the investment world is um, paying so much attention to this. And I'm sure there are investors, as you mentioned, Laura, that, that are, are not only not paying attention to it, they are objecting to it. Um, and, and that's fine. And it isn't a zero sum game. It's not like you have to say to all investors, you have to pay attention to this. We mm -hmm. would encourage you, um, as a strategic advantage, but at the same time, you don't have to, um, and the investment world, uh, for the, in large part is, and that's, that is an interesting trend. I want to uh, allow time for questions from uh, our viewers. We've got a few already. Um, and uh, so if you do have a question, you're on the Zoom platform, please use the Q&A function and we will uh, uh, see them there. If you are streaming on social media, please just ask your question in the social media platform you're on and we will be sure to respond. Um, so one question here, and I'll be interested to see how both of you uh, answer this one. Um, when it comes to measuring accessibility, can you share best practices, advice, strategies that enable a fulsome data extraction? Who would like to uh, take a kick at that one? Maybe I could go, Dana. It feels like it came up for you all organically, which I think is great. Um, so for us at Diversio, from the very beginning, when we started collecting demographic data, we included accessibility and disability as a core category. So the same time that you collect gender data, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, sexual identity, we also say, while you're there, please collect data on neurodiversity, mental health conditions, physical disabilities, et cetera. And um, so for us, it's been like really critical and there's a lot of fascinating findings. So I'm not surprised, Dana, to hear that that came up in the free text. We're seeing that about 30% of staff um, during and after the pandemic identified as having some mental health condition. So everything from anxiety, PTSD, depression, eating disorders, like it's really, it's, um, I'm not, I'm sure it's a combination of it's going up, it's a tough time to be alive, but also awareness is growing. People are, you know, self-diagnosing or getting diagnosed. So um, in terms of collecting the data, there are categories. You typically, you need to be, you know, responsive to your staff, whether comfortable sharing, you want to, Think about what terminology is used given where in the world you're located, but asking people to self-identify along those lines goes a really long way. And then similarly, like you want to ask questions about their experience that you can then filter or cut by those demographics. So it's 
things like, you know, do you have challenges coming to the office? How do you like to engage in meetings? Do you prefer to be virtual? Do you prefer to be in person? Things like that. If you're able to, if you're collecting the demographic data, you overlay that against experience data. And that really helps you with data, get a picture of how accessible your workplace is. Dana, what about from you? Yeah, um, uh, I think Laura's right. It, it definitely, it surfaced organically for us at first. Um, and I think everything we've talked about, about just um, ensuring that you have a culture of trust um, and that people feel comfortable to share that is, is probably key to that that um, accessibility free tax coming out. Um, and then I agree with Laura. I think there's there are bite-sized ways of asking about how are you doing um, and how are you feeling and do you need support in XYZ way that are not, um, do you have an invisible disability? Um, and we use um, uh, pulse checks in our um, all team, all hands um, on a weekly basis to ask questions of all sorts. But we've, we've asked things like, how much do you enjoy working in a remote, remote environment? Do you feel connected to the team? Do you feel, feel connected to your team? Do you feel like you know the leadership of this team as humans? And um, so you can ask, I know this isn't necessarily accessibility specific, but um, you can ask more pointed questions that feel a little, that are A, are anonymous and B, feel a little bit easier to digest and, and to be open about um, than create, trying to figure out a formal way to collect this data that can feel really overwhelming and intimidating to both data collector and data giver. Yeah. It, it, accessibility is such an interesting uh, topic and I'm adamant that it's included in the um, acronym that I use in describing my work because I, I do fear that uh, as a person who lives with um, what is technically referred to as a disability, um, uh, I, I feel like we get left off a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much to measuring it, though. I think about measuring the physical space and doing some sort of um, audit of your physical space, but it's not one thing. Like you can't think, okay, well, we've got assistive door, uh, assistive devices on the doors. Therefore it's an accessible space because that's not necessarily accessible for somebody who is neurodivergent, um, for somebody who lives with epilepsy. Uh, you know, you have to think about lighting. You have to think about, um, air circulation, there are so many aspects of accessibility from a physical space. The one thing I will give you a, a shout out, Laura, that I was really impressed with from a Diversio perspective, and I was I was skeptical at first, but then I saw it in action, was you don't ask the question in your um, sort of standard template if someone lives with a quote unquote disability. Um, you ask if you live with a condition and there's three pages of them, it's different conditions. And um, I know someone who was working with Diversio asked this question and they saw an incredibly high rate of people who lived with conditions, but mm. who didn't identify as living with a disability. Yeah. And that word is a bit hotly contested. So I, I just throw it to you. Is there, what was the reasoning behind that? from your perspective? Well, I'm sure my team would give you a very well-reasoned, um, you know, we looked at the landscape and engaged a million people, et cetera, et cetera. Selfishly, like I am neurodiverse and I do not believe that that's a disability. I really don't. I think there's pros and cons to it. And um, I just, the whole, I, I don't like the connotation. Um, even I, I prefer differently able to a physical disability, but then again, you know, it's a balance of what do people understand and look for. So it's, You've got to um, come together. I think one thing, just a little bit off off on a tangent, but I think it's it's important because we do get a lot of people. It's critical given the percentage of workforces that have a condition. You can't get bogged down by where do I start. And so the way that we typically work with companies that have not looked at this before, it's like okay, let's start with who is currently in the organization. So let's start and try and identify what conditions are most present now. Next step is going to be, okay, how do we get more people with different conditions? Because we know that that will benefit us and we're going to make the business case for it, really understand it. But let's start with who is there now. And so to your point, if it turns out that the plurality or the majority of people have a physical disability, okay, let's start with accessibility for that kind of individual. Then let's think about on-ramps, let's think about elevators, et cetera, et cetera. Just as a starting point, that's going to service the most of your community. If it turns out that 
anxiety, depression are the most common conditions. Let's think about how do we change the work day? Let's think about how do we interact? Let's think about mental health days, et cetera, et cetera. So in my mind, it's like start by getting the lay of the land, understand who's there, figure out the current problems that exist, solve those, and then think about how do we become more expansive and more engaging and more inclusive of other conditions? Because again, it will only benefit us to have access to different individuals. Yeah, I'm I'm in, in your camp as a person who lives with a condition uh, or a few of them. I don't think of it as a disability. And I think that actually has to do with how uh, the questions are asked, how the word disability is defined. Um, you know, I I have a different, uh, you know, way of functioning in life, but I don't need any help. I'm good. Um, and it's it's just a different aspect of, of how I function. Um, we are very much at the end of our time. Last question, uh, where can everybody find you? Dana, I'll start with you. Um, well, you can go to letshighlight.com and apply to be a highlighter, test some cool new products for in exchange for feedback. Um, uh, please reach out on LinkedIn. Um, I would love to stay connected. Um, yeah. That's great. I Laura, would say you, you? you can find both Dana and I either in a cafe or wine bar in West Village <laughs> <laughs> on any given Thursday. Um, no, you can find me Laura at diversio.com. Um, check us out. Follow us on social media. Always, always happy to engage. That's great. And we will paste those links into the chat, uh, both here in Zoom as well as on the social medias. Thank you so much for um, being part of this conversation. I feel like we could keep going for a very long time. Um, it's a fascinating topic and there's so much to dig in here. Um, so thank you for being here and for, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, and thank you to all who tuned in. I hope you found it informative, valuable, uh, if you did, please feel free to post about it on social media using the hashtag ideas with Michael Bach. If you did not enjoy it, why are you still here? There's so much else to be doing. Um, speaking of social media, if you haven't already done so, uh, please do connect with me. I am at the Michael Bach on all of the platforms um, that I'm on. The next episode of Ideas with Michael Bach airs on Wednesday, May the 15th, 2024 at 1 p.m. Eastern or GMT plus five where again, I will have not one, but two guests, Michelle Myers, Vice President of Marketing and Rachel Pearson, Vice President of Community and Government Affairs, both with experienced Scottsdale. We'll be talking about delivering on an inclusive brand focused on one of their campaigns that really caught my attention uh, as part of the inclusive communications theme. You will not want to miss that. So I hope you will join us. If you haven't already registered, you can do so at michaelbach.com slash ideas. And I may have some exciting news about that one. So definitely make sure you are connected with me to find out more about that. That's it for today. Thank you again for joining us. And I look forward to talking with you again. Thanks, everyone. Take care.